In this lecture, we'll discuss the power spectral density. The word spectrum was coined by Newton to describe how white light is, is split through a prism and then splits out into the rainbow color that you all are well aware of. The word comes from specter, meaning ghost. So it is a ghostly apparition that we are studying. By definition, the power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the auto covariance function over all possible frequencies. In the discrete case, that means the frequencies from minus pi to pi. In the continuous case, of course, this is going to be an integral, but it's going to and going from minus infinity to infinity. In this course, we are mainly looking at the discrete case, so I will stick to this. I can, of course, retrieve the auto covariance function by taking the inverse Fourier transform like this, which is going to be an integral from minus pi to pi, because the power spectral density is a continuous function over all these frequencies. It's worth noting that if I look particularly at lag zero, that is going to be the integral over the full spectrum, meaning that the area underneath the spectrum is going to be a measure of the variance of the process. Here I am assuming the process to be zero mean, which in this case the variance is going to be a measure of power. In this sense you can see that the power spectral density is a density in the sense that at each given frequency it tells you the spectral mass at that frequency. It's the spectral density of that frequency. The power spectral density is going to be a real valued function and it's non-negative. So you can think about dark powers but not negative powers. The power spectral density will never be negative. For a real valued process the power spectral density is symmetric, meaning that I should expect it to look something like this, whereas if I have complex data, I will have a non-symmetric spectrum. So I should expect it to look something more like that. In the particular case of a white noise, I will take the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, but of course there is only one lag, so that means that the power spectral density will be flat. That's why we call it white. It has all frequencies. And of course this also tells you that this is not going to happen in reality. There are no, no measurements that you can expect to contain all possible frequencies in any form of realistic measurements. However, it can be a very good approximation in a band, so you can expect something looking like this, so that in you know in the low frequency part, which you know in the, in this region, it's going to be fairly flat, and therefore it makes a lot of sense to model that something as a white noise over a limited band. And we will, as I mentioned before, use the white process very frequently in constructing our models. If I look at the sinusoidal process that we were examining before, this one, the output oh this should be an R here. So the autocorrelation function will have this form that I expressed previously. If I take the Fourier transform of that using Euler's formula, I see that I have two Dirac impulses one at the positive frequency and one at the negative, so that the, the power spectral density of a sinusoid will look like this. One frequency at omega zero and one frequency at minus omega zero like this, with Dirac impulses at both locations. The additive white noise will have a flat power spectral density, so I should expect the, the process to have a spectrum looking like that. A flat spectrum with two Dirac impulses sticking out of it. Under the weak assumption that my auto covariance function is decaying sufficiently rapidly, the power spectral density can equivalently be expressed as the expected value of the Fourier transform of the data as the number of data points goes to infinity. Of course, you don't have all these realizations to be able to compute the expectation, and you don't have an infinite amount of samples. So what you do is you basically say, oh, I pretend I didn't see this limitation, I don't speed the expectation, and I will take my estimate being just the magnitude squared of the Fourier transform of the data. This is called the periodogram, invented by Schuster in 1898 to, to, to look at the periodicities of the sunspot. So the sun has a surface of heat of about 6,000 degrees, but there will have some regions that are all about 4,000 degrees appearing as black spots on the sun. And since the sun has, you know, for thousands of years been assumed to be something perfect, people have been studying these and counting the number of sunspots. So we have measurements of the number of sunspots going back a very long time ago. So this is what they look like. So Schuster was trying to determine the periodicity of these sunspots and try to figure out what was going on here. And this is actually a topic that has attracted a lot of attention. It actually happens that these sunspots affect the, the solar winds and therefore affect the uh, interference for mobile channel traffic here well on Earth. So the periodicities of sunspots is important for practical purposes also for telecommunication in current days. Another way of estimating the power spectral density would be what's called the correlelogram. Then you take it, go back to the definition, but you just say, well, I can't estimate the co covariance functions for all the lags up to infinity and minus infinity, so I'll just truncate at the highest possible lag, which is n minus 1. And then you form the power spectral density estimate like that. That is the correlelogram. Both of these estimators are actually equivalent. They are asymptotically unbiased, but they are not consistent. This is a very strong drawback of the, of the periodogram estimator. It's not consistent. And you can actually show that the variance of the estimator depends on the true power spectrum squared. That means that if the true spectrum looks like this, your variance of your estimate will be low where there's little power, but it will be large where there's a lot of power. And since almost always you're interested in the location of power, this is a really bad sign. If I look at the periodogram estimate of a white noise, you can see this. So you know that the white noise should have a flat 
power spectral density, but as you can see here, it's varying quite a lot, making it very difficult to claim that this is uh, as a flat line. That variability you see here is the variability of the periodogram. This is how much the periodogram wiggles sample to sample, and it's just the reliability you have in your estimate. Very commonly here is that you are presenting your power spectral estimate in absolute frequency. That means that you have uh, the spectrum going from minus a half to a half instead of from minus pi to pi. This is just subjective. Instead of radiance, you have absolute frequencies. This is very commonly done, so you will see both cases uh, occurring very frequently. Often you also look at the, the power spectral density in dB, so you take the log of your power spectral density and scale it like, like this instead, so you get a more flat spectral estimate like this, so it makes more sense to see. You can see the little wiggly details a little bit better, and this is actually what's, what's commonly done to be able to see the things going on in your spectral estimate. You typically also zero pad your estimate. That means that if I have my data like this, I will append zeros lots of zeros in the end, and then I will take the Fourier transform of that data, forming the power spectral density of these appended zeros. These are zero padded. Of course, that doesn't add any information. I don't learn anything more by adding zeros to my data, but what it does is that it computes the power spectral density on a finer grid. It interpolates the power spectral density so I get it on a finer grid. So look at this, the example of the, of the sunspots. This is the periodogram estimate without any zero padding, whereas this is the estimate if I did zero padded. What you can see here is, that, of course, that the points you see in the non-zero padded are going to be exactly occurring at, at the other one as well, but you would miss the fine details, and you, you, if you looking for the peak to find the periodicity, you will not see it in the case when you didn't zero pad because you just didn't have enough resolution in your frequency grid to be able to see where this peak was there. Note that you do not actually gain any information by doing that. So all the information in the spectrum was in both, is the same in both of these figures, but clearly you can see the fine structure much easier in the one that where you have zero padded the data. So if I look at the peak in my power spectral density to find the main periodicity of my data, uh, I will get an absolute frequency of 0 0.008 here for the sunspot, which is about 11.5 years. If I didn't use zero padding, I will have assumed that this was the main periodicity of the data, and then I will get an estimate of the periodicity which would be quite erroneous. I suggest you try it yourself on the data that's provided in the, in the, in, on the web page, and you see what you would get and see how much uh, worse that estimate would be. Very often, you also choose to add a window here, V in the, the time domain, or W in the uh, lag domain. What these windows are is nothing but to something that takes the value 1 over the interval 0 to n minus 1 here, uh, or uh, in this case from minus n plus 1 to n minus 1. Obviously, this doesn't change anything, so by, by seeing this as a rectangular window, you're not adding anything to it. The point here is that you can change these windows into other windows, but to be able to understand what is going on, you would want to see the effect of the windowing itself. Recall from your system theory that the, uh, the, the multiplication in time domain is the same thing as the convolution in frequency domain. So that means that I will spread the uh, information in the power spectral density with the spreading of the window function in the frequency domain. So if I look at the frequency representation of these windows, I will get a sync function in this case, and of course I will get an absolute value of the sync function in this case since it's its quadratic form. You will see that this will of course create a smearing effect in my spectrum. We speak about the main lobe, this is the width of the main lobe. It's going to be roughly 1 over n, where that's the sample in absolute frequency, meaning that anything that is closer together than about 1 over n, it will be very difficult for me to see. If I plot this a little more properly, you can see the main lobe here. This is the one that's about 1 over n. And you can see the side lobe. Those are the, the effects, the uh, sync function as it, as it goes down. These side lobes will cause spurious peaks to appear in my spectral estimate. So if I look at an example of a real-valued sinusoid, the true spectrum is going to be two Dirac impulses. So what you can see in this example is how the convolution of this window will affect the sinusoid. So instead of being a Dirac impulse, you see I get something with quite a substantial width here. In the case, I only had eight data points. And for the case when I have more data points, of course, the width is going to be much smaller because it's about one over n. You can also see the side lobes occurring here on the side, causing something that appears like spurious peaks, something that is happening. There are frequencies where they use, it looks like there's power, but there really is none. One way to diminish this is to add other forms of windows. So if I only plot the positive parts of the frequency, this is going to be the rectangular window that I was looking at before. Here is an example of another window called the Hamming window. As you, what you can see here, first of all, you should see that the side lobes are much lower than in the rectangular window. But you should also notice that the main lobe is wider. So any form of windowing that I will use will cause the, wide, the main lobe to widen. So that means that the resolution will always go down. There's no way to avoid that. If you apply a window, your main lobe will widen. You can reduce the variability that you get due to the side lobes by adding the window. And as you see here, when I have a window that has much stronger side lobe suppression, 
the main lobe is wider. So there's a trade-off between the width of the main lobe and the suppression of the side lobes. Here is a couple of examples. You can read about this in more detail in the spectral analysis book. It's available on my webpage. It's an excellent book on the topic. If we look at an example data, so here is a voice speech of a woman saying, why were you away a year, Roy? And if I just look at 20 milliseconds of the data, during 20 milliseconds your, vo your speech is basically stationary. So you can assume that the data you have here has the same statistical properties. And if I look at it, you can see there seems to be some clear ringing in the data. If I compute the autocorrelation function, you can see this ringing quite clearly. If I then go on compute the power spectral density estimate using the periodogram, this is what you see. You can see that the, the, the voice speech contains a fundamental frequency, which is then, say we call it omega zero, and then there is overtones, two omega zero, three omega zero, four omega zero, and so forth. We say that the tonal sound has an harmonic structure, so that there are, you can well describe it as containing harmonically related sinusoids. And this is actually one of the models that used to do to model voice speech. So you divide speech into voice speech and unvoiced speech. So voice speech would be something like ah, it has a clear ringing, whereas unvoiced speech is like Pff, which is basically noise. So you, if you want to do a speech coder, you describe this either as describing the sinusoids that you transmit for the vocal part, or the shape of the noise to describe the non-tonal part of it. And this is exactly how a speech coder works. Interestingly, there are actually ways to get around this limit to that of windowing that we saw here before. So this is a two-dimensional spectral estimate. So of course, you can have just another dimension with no problem. So this is a two-dimensional estimate of a MIG fighter jet. And here you can see the periodogram. You can see the side lobes quite clearly causing these rippling effects that you see. And you also see the main lobe, the width of the main lobe. Here's another estimator, which is called Kepon. And what the thing you should see here is that there's basically no side lobes. So you can get a much clearer image. There's nothing that prevents it here. But at the same time, your main lobe is also narrower. So there are ways of getting spectral estimates that are better than the periodogram that does not involve windowing. And for that, I do really recommend, again, this book by Petra Stoika and uh, Randy Moses. You might be wondering, why would you want this resolution? Well, here's an example when you need the resolution. So this is called a synthetic aperture radar. That means you take your airplane, you image a piece of ground. In this case, it's a Michigan State in the U.S. And then you move your airplane, and in each different time you pulse and you monitor the same part of the ground all the time. By this you can compute a three-dimensional image of the ground by constructing a synthetic aperture. That is the same thing as you pretend that all your sensors simultaneously measured one wave hitting all the sensors at the same time. The resolution on the ground will then be dictated by the width of your synthetic aperture. And of course, if you want to see fine details on the ground from space, say, you would really want to have a high resolution on the ground given the aperture you were able to construct using your flight path. One of the interesting aspects of synthetic aperture radar is you can set the wavelength and that so you can determine what it should be reflected on. Here it's been chosen to be reflecting on the on the canopy, that is the leaves, so therefore you can see the trees very clearly. In, in cases where this is interesting is, for instance, in the Amazon, there's always going to be a cloud over the Amazon due to the, the humidity uh, over the rainforest. So you cannot take aerial pictures of the rainforest to be able to see how much logging is going on underneath the clouds. However, you can set the frequency, like in this case for reflecting on the canopy, and their way you be able to tell very easily how much logging is going on. You can also change it so, for instance, that you have another wavelength so you can see through the canopy so you can see if there, for instance, are vehicle underneath the trees, which is a topic that the military has been quite interested in for some time. Finally, we look at the spectrogram. The spectrogram is when you basically just take the data and divide it into subchunks like this. And for each of the subchunks, you compute the spectrum. And then you present that spectrum as one line in your image. Creating a time frequency representation of your data. This is the spectrogram. So here you can see the why were you away a year, Roy, phrase. And you can see the fundamental frequency, how it varies over time as the, uh, the tonal part is changing. But you can also see that the number of overtones is changing. And then also the fact that you have some regions where you are missing some tones, such that the harmonic structure is actually not valid for that region. And this is actually quite common. So for many kinds of sounds, you will have the harmonic structure, but you might also have missing harmonics. A particular example is, for instance, car engines, where which often miss the first component, the fundamental frequency itself. And so you only have the overtone structure there, even though with missile samples. So of course, if you would build an estimator, you want to exploit this structure that it's there, you know that it's there, but it's not going to be reliably there. So you want to have an estimator that can exploit this structure, but also take into account that possibly you have tones that are missing in your voice or in the other kind of sounds that you are looking at.